Hello and welcome to Become the Teapot. I'm your friendly neighbourhood Ian. And you know, I'm something of a Ian myself. Who are we? You sure you want to know? Well okay then, we're a podcast that talks about comic books and their adaptations. But if somebody told you we were comic book experts, somebody lied. It's the start of our second year and a perfect jumping on point for the show, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on what's coming up. This episode, we're revisiting Sam Raimi's 2002 film, Spider-Man. Before swinging by the Silver Age of comic books for Amazing Fantasy 15, Amazing Spider-Man 39-40 and Amazing Spider-Man 121-122. So, dust off your web shooters. You, You do know he doesn't use web shooters in this one. Then where does the web come from? Just sort of a a big hole in his arm. But that doesn't make scientific sense. Listen, bud, he's got radioactive blood. None of this makes any scientific sense. Fair point. Should we get on with it? Yeah, right. Then look out. Here comes the Spider-Man. Spider-Man 2002, Sam Raimi, what are your thoughts of this film? I mean, overall, it's pretty damn good. I mean, I was, wasn't in dread, but I thought by going back to this, I thought I'd come away like unimpressed or annoyed by it, but it still holds up. It's still a good film. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's surprisingly good. Better than I remember, actually. Mm. It's just good fun. Yeah, my only bad point about it, or one of the bad points about it, is, as we said in the intro, about his organic web. (laughs) Are you a fan of it? Generally speaking, no, but um, I don't have a problem with it. I don't think anything is more scientifically viable. It's just a bit gross. Mm. And it's the way that he holds his hand as well. It makes sense in the comics, makes sense in the cartoons. He's got a little, like, pad that he has to press. Yeah, he's got a button. Yeah, so why does that same hand thing work when it's organic maybe it's the the wrist and hand motion just the way it comes out (laughs) i mean you'd think it would work with the fist as well because the fingers would still be clenched i mean but that's always been the case with the comic book there's no reason why he can only press that button with his middle two fingers if he pressed his whole hand down that would be the same effect yeah so every time he closes fist he should just be squirting stuff everywhere (laughs) oh god (laughs) (laughs) you gotta take that with a, a pinch of salt i think pinch of web yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I just find it's a bit gross. He's just going around leaving his uh, bio residue everywhere, all over the city. And he must just get really dehydrated, is all I can imagine. It's just, oh God, this is... Yeah. <laughs> really tired. I have to eat so much protein to generate all of this web. <laughs> I mean, I think they were going to use the web shooters. Mm. Because there's the scene in the bedroom where he's spraying his web <laughs> everywhere. Ugh. They did use a web shooter there right okay. they actually cgi'd it out Ah, oh, okay didn't know that I'm not sure why but there you go tidbit well i guess they changed it for plausibility reasons they didn't think it was plausible that a uh, a teenager even though he's clearly 30 <laughs> could make a, uh, a web shooter thing yeah i mean it's a superhero film i kind of think that either way you just gotta go yeah whatever and go with it as long as it's vaguely believable <laughs> <laughs> well i bet that he had more organic webbing after that weird but iconic upside down kiss yeah if you know what i mean (laughs) i do know what you mean i see what you're doing it's an innuendo for sperm (laughs) (laughs) no yeah yeah i gotta say that is an iconic scene it it looks very uncomfortable and awkward but it Mm. is an iconic scene it really reminded me of how sexless the mcu is that scene (laughs) (laughs) i mean generally in the film mj is a bit of a damsel in distress i find but i can't deny that those two have chemistry Mm. the thing is in the mcu even when the leads have chemistry they're never allowed to show it yeah you know it's always quite earnest and unrequited love and when they do get together it's usually between films and then the next film they're married or something like that it's something that this manages to convey is genuine attraction without going the whole hog. Yeah. Don't know if you ever heard of that. This originally James Cameron was planning on doing an adaptation of Spider Man. Yeah. It was meant to be an R rated one, which included kinky bondage sex on top of a bridge where Spider Man would web up Mary Jane whilst telling her spider sex facts. Why? <laughs> no. James Cameron, no. No? You're not a fan of that? No, I'm not a fan of that at all. Would you have liked to have seen it just for curiosity's sake? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it 
probably exists online. <laughs> I think you're I think you're going to the wrong site. <laughs> anyway, let's take a sort of swift turn away from that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've already gone into some of the casting. As you said, the chemistry between Toby and Kirsten, I think that works really well. Mm-hmm. It comes across on screen great. Just to, to talk about Toby then. Yeah. I always said, this was pre-Tom Holland, I always said that Toby was the better Peter Parker and Andrew was the better Spider-Man mm. because Toby was that sort of scientific kid who was nerdy and got picked on. Yeah. And then Andrew had the quips and the flips and all of this sort of stuff. Yeah. But Andrew was far too cool with his spiky up hair and his <laughs> skateboard and all of this stuff. But going back to it, I think I was a bit harsh on Toby, his version of Spider-Man. Yeah. Because it works well. He does both really, really well. I think he does, yeah. I think his Spider-Man is generally... I don't think his quips always land, but I think that's a writing issue. But they are definitely there. I mean, I think I could do a few homophobic jokes during the wrestling match, but uh, (laughs) it reminds me of one of my favourite memes where Bonesaw tells him off, but we won't go into that now. But um, (laughs) but, uh, I think you're right. I think he does play that nerdy archetype very well. I think he plays it certainly better than Andrew Garfield. Hmm. And I find that Tom Holland, when I watch his films, he doesn't quip that much either. As Spider-Man, he doesn't actually do that many quips. It's Yeah, the only thing that I can think of is the airport scene in um, Civil War. Because mm. he's fighting Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yeah. He's like, oh, is that a metal arm? Oh, cool. And carbon fibre wings and all this sort of stuff. To me, that's still him being the Peter Parker persona. That's still him being a nerdy yeah. and interested kid as opposed to... In the comics, Spider-Man's quippage was always because he was putting on a persona because he going out fighting crime. It's a scary thing to do. So he puts on a persona and mm-hmm. dials up that comedic side above and beyond what his normal behaviour would be because, yeah, he's ordinarily, he's quite a, a nervous and timid character in a way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, in the in the airport scene, it's very much a starstruck boy in the headlights sort of, you know, nerdy portrayal. You know, he could have easily done that as himself. Mm. It happened again. We talked about <laughs> the film we're not talking about. Going back to Parker in this film. Yeah. They're also mean to him for no reason at all. <laughs> they're so harsh. Even after he wins a fight with the school bully, mm. they're like, oh, you're weird. Oh, you beat him. Nerd. It's almost like bullies have got no reason for doing what they're doing. Well, they... And it is just arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> I liked that and I like because we'll talk about the comic later but that's exactly how the bullying went in the comic book which is so petty and just so like shut up you nerd about everything he did and like (laughs) thought bubbles in the comic book it's my favourite thing the the thought bubbles of people just thinking what a loser he is and I'm like that's a really really that's that's bullying beyond is you're doing it in your own head now you're like what an idiot (laughs) (laughs) but yeah yeah I think he does pull off that um, I'd say he's not age appropriate no all of the characters look like they're in their 30s in that school but Mm -hmm. apart from Kirsten Dunst who looks like she's in her 20s because she was I think they probably all were I don't know yeah mid to late 20s I guess I would guess so but yeah I think he does a really good job with that sort of nerdy persona and the other casting that is obviously excellent well there's several several people in this who have been cast to perfection Mm -hmm. but Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin I love it fantastic I love Willem Dafoe anyway yeah I think in this he is scary, and yes, his costume looks like a rejected Power Rangers villain, but <laughs> that Thanksgiving scene and those little golem like monologues he's doing to the mirror and the mask yeah. and things like that, I think it really shows the depths of his insanity, his delusions, and there's real menace there. That scene works so well where he's talking to himself mm. and the way it's been shot as well and put together. If you start us off with just this voice in his head and then it just cuts from him in the mirror and him not. Yeah. And he captures it so well. It's like a madman talking to himself, but then you see his two characters and it's... The only one thing... Well, I said this earlier on that I've got a couple of gripes with this film, but not many. It's that he's got such an expressive face. Why would you cover it with a big plastic, huge green mask? Well, especially one that looks exactly like his own face. But yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. I think they had an animatronic... I, I remember seeing a mask, a uh, behind-the-scenes thing, with an animatronic mask, mm. which was more like the comic book 
Green Goblin, so it had the purple hat yeah. and it was more of a, uh, a fleshy thing that could move. And I think that might have been a bit more expressive. And Willem Dafoe can do a lot with his eyes when those eye shields pop open and he can project that with his eyes and, and still convey menace. But yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think it is hampering the performance, especially as he's in what is quite clearly a quite a rigid suit. So he's having to sort of dance around a bit jankily and <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. But no, I, I still think he manages it. I think if you've got a lesser actor in that role, they wouldn't be able to convey anywhere near what he did i mean it is cheesy it is over the top yeah it's not a subtle performance but the role doesn't call for that so fine you know? no you do need a like we said this sort of crazy man this scientist who's gone mental you need that and the casting of him as the green goblin and as norman osborne mm-hmm. almost said harry works so well yeah yeah and the other perfect casting in this is obviously I J. Think Jonah I know Jameson. Who you're say. <laughs> J. J. Jonah K. Jameson Simmons. is amazing. Perfect. And he's only in I didn't realise how he was only in this film for what, five, ten minutes. He's barely in it. He's in a I think three scenes. Yeah. And I might be being too it, kind. It may it only be two? be two. No, I think it was three. Two with Parker and one without. And he leaves his stamp on that. And I think his role got dialed up in the sequels, didn't it? Yeah. I just think he's amazing. I mean, I, I love him as an actor anyway. J.K. Simmons is great. Can't believe it took him, what, 15 years after this to get his Oscar for Whiplash. Again, great film. Yes, absolutely amazing performance. But I just can't see anyone else in that role. And I'm sure if you put the wig and the moustache on someone else, they'd be able to do it and make him look like that. Yeah. But because he's already done it, that is now ingrained in people's minds. That is the performance that people will remember and they will compare it against. Yeah. And he is a comic book villain in a way he is so over the top in his hatred of spider-man but he has that moment of vulnerability when he defends peter parker says he doesn't know who the photographer is that is textbook j jonah jameson from the comics and i loved it yeah i was trying to work this out is he being kind to parker not to tell the goblin that it's parker and then he'd be attacked or is he trying to save the paper because if parker's gone the Spider-Man pictures won't be there, so he won't sell as many copies. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a mixed kind of thing. I don't think it is mixed because he is putting his own life at risk to defend Peter Parker in that moment. He is lying to the goblin, to his face, whilst his life is under threat, to defend one of his employees. And that is what J. Jonah Jameson has done in the comics time and time again. So I think it's very much comic accurate. He's also, however, created loads of different supervillains and got people killed. So, you know, it's inconsistent, <laughs> let's say at best. But yeah. The other one I was surprised about, and I didn't remember liking it as much, because obviously this is 2002. We would have been, what, 14, 15 when this came out? Yeah, maybe younger. The other thing I, I was surprised about is how much I enjoyed Uncle Ben's performance. Yeah. I think that's a real heart to the film is how subtle and how real that performance feels and he delivers one of the most iconic lines of spider-man lore Mm -hmm. and he does it in a way that is entirely believable it doesn't feel cheesy it doesn't feel tacked on it feels so natural within that conversation yeah yeah i was really does i was surprised by that because you know he's not uh, it's cliff robertson i think and he's not an actor that i know much about and and he died 2011 i haven't really seen much of his work outside of spider-man so i'm impressed by it and he does feel like a real person i found that with the other spider-man uncles and aunts Mm -hmm. they were becoming increasingly famous so the celebrity uncle and aunt they kept getting big name actors they did that whole marvel and uh, christopher nolan thing where they get huge name actors around a um a lesser known peter parker yeah and as such they just didn't feel as believable as as real human beings whereas this one i genuinely believe his uncle and aunt they're a bit old to be uncle and aunt i'll be honest they're more like grandparents but yeah that always confused me when i think when i first saw this years ago mm. i thought oh does aunt mean gran in america because she's so old <laughs> I was like is that is that how it works i think it says that uncle ben is 67 at the beginning of this so i suppose he could just be an old uncle you know that would have been what if peter was 18 at that point so 49 mm. and then if obviously if he's the older brother of peter's dad then there could be an age difference between him and peter's dad so it it works out in theory well really Parker's 30 so yeah yeah yeah. that's if you dial that into it everyone (laughs) is aged up 10 years from where they should be (laughs) but yeah no I I really like the film generally speaking it's good fun Mm. you said a couple of times that there are a few bits that you didn't like though so what were they well I've covered a couple of them so far one bit that not really a gripe but it annoyed me a little bit when MJ says to the scientist tour guide lady person um 
oh, there's 14, not 15 here. And she's like, meh, oh well, I won't get checked. <laughs> she does say, I mean, oh, you surely you should. She, she's a tour guide, not a scientist, isn't it? Oh no, she's a tour guide and a scientist, I suppose. But she does say, oh, they must have taken out for experiments. Yeah, but if they're that important and they're that poisonous, I guess, you would go and check, surely. Well, maybe not. Oh, she didn't. Maybe it's routine. Maybe they're often taken out of those cases and it's quite a common occurrence for them to be testing on these spiders. And she's used to seeing them half empty. <laughs> you don't know. I don't know. You're right. I don't know much. <laughs> and what else do you got? The stupid sick burns. And I use that in, in quotes. When they're again at that science thing, mm. one of the jocks is like, oh, careful. His father will fire your father. I'm like, are you trying to be hurtful? Because that's not hurtful at all. <laughs> like, it's more the script, really. It's not a perfect script. Yeah, but I, I think it's. I think those moments are meant to show. It's meant to be stupid teenagers. Yeah. It's kind of like you know the penis Parker in the latest ones. You know, it's not a clever insult. It is a stupid insult <laughs> if you think about it for more than two seconds. It's not an insult at all. Mm. So I think it's meant to be crap it's not meant to be like oh what a wicked sick burn take that harry (laughs) ah my feelings oh you wait till i get spider powers and i come after you i don't think harry ever got spider powers well he might have done in a parallel spider-man universe goblin powers what if harry was spider-man there you go marvel there's a uh what if for you yeah i mean it's just a couple of things but i'm not gonna sit here and go through them all good i mean we've sort of said that the film we both agree here that it sort of holds up Mm. we think the CGI special effects. What did you make of those? Okay, so they are early 2000s special effects. Yes. But they aren't terrible. They're very watchable. I don't think they're mm-hmm. that bad at all. There are some moments where you can obviously see it's PS2 graphics, but yeah. it's to be expected. It's dated, yes, but that's because it is 20 years old now. Yeah, it's the bits where the first scene where he's popping across all the roofs. Well, that's clearly... CGI. <laughs> and when he puts on his first suit and starts climbing up the walls, mm-hmm. you like again. But then as you sorry, as he gets his second suit, it changes. I don't know what they've done. They updated their software halfway through the film, but suddenly it's fine. They probably created a better CG render of the actual suit that they'd be using more, and then obviously, you know, had to create another one, which which was more fabric-y as well, wasn't it? It was looser fitting. Mm. So it probably is harder to animate. I don't know. I'm not an animation guru. <laughs> That's me. That's you. Yeah, come on. I've seen your animation skills. <laughs> I saw that um, Sean Connery animation you did with him speaking. <laughs> Flawless. Fantastic, wasn't it? You have not got the right to criticise anyone's work, son. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I will go back to a certain gripe that I've just <laughs> thought of. The bit where Parker faces Uncle Ben's killer yeah. in the warehouse. And then there's like a really stupid flashback. <laughs> It's like, oh, you know that guy that we saw two minutes earlier? Yeah. Let's do a flashback to it in case you forgot his face. Oh, that was him. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they... So they, glad they did a flashback. They could have done it with a reaction shot. He clearly remembers who that is. But nope, they had to show the flash. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious, though, to be honest. I think there's so many things in here that are just so extra, so over the top. Yeah. And I think that's its style. I think, actually, that's to its credit rather than to its detriment. It feels cheesy by today's standards, but it actually lends it a lot of flavour. You know, that when these... Um, having the nightmares after being bitten and there's just a random skull appears as on the screen like, <laughs> and all this stuff flashing up on screen as he's thinking about stuff it's it's great yeah i mean it does work i mean these are small things that i'm like oh that's a bit annoying yeah that's daft but it works well this is it there's films that we've seen before that don't hold up and it's terrible yeah this one does and even though it's quite comical it's a comic book film. Yeah, exactly. So it works. Exactly. I, at the end of the day, I saw all those bits you're saying about, and yeah, okay, they do stick out, but I sat there for two hours and I chuckled my way through this. Yeah. It's great fun. It flies by. It's a really good origin story. It's got genuine character as a film in and of itself. Mm-hmm. It feels like its own thing. And I just think it's good fun. Mm, it is. I mean, you say there that it's two hours long. I think half of that's taken up by the opening credits. Such a long opening credits. I was hoping to get that sort of skip bit that you do on Netflix. Oh, I never used that. I couldn't because it was on disc. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of the um, X-Men opening credits as well, but with no Patrick Stewart narration. No opening monologue. <laughs> oh, actually, there is one from Peter Parker. There is, yeah, yeah. And a closing monologue, which was the uh, the big thing of comic books at the time and also in Aquaman from like two years ago. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, it all comes back around, doesn't it? So I think we're both in agreement about the film. Shall we move on to the comic? Yeah, sure. Why not? So which one did you read then? Which one did I read? Yeah, you, you gave me a list of five. Uh, so I thought it was like a sort of pick a mix, like choose your own. Uh, I see what's going on here. Ah, You're doing a bit. I'm doing a bit. No, I, I did read all of them. <laughs> Don't worry. All five <laughs> comics. That's impressive. <laughs> so the five comics in question are Amazing Fantasy 15 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Amazing Spider-Man 39 to 40 by Stan Lee and John Romita. And Amazing Fantasy 121 to 122 by Jerry Conway and Gil Kane. So I think this is the first time that we've covered a run of comic books with a number of different writers and artists. Yes. It's interesting to see the variety on offer and how the styles change. So what did you think of the comics? Well, I think we should run through them then in that order because it makes sense. Yeah. Amazing Spider-Man. No, it's not called that. (laughs) Amazing (laughs) Fantasy 15. Yes. I mean, it's a bit of a daft thing to say, but it's so 60s. I mean, the artwork, the writing style, we've gone back to old stuff from Marvel before, Mm. but this is just more of that. It's extra. Yes. Even the language that it's used, it's, again, so 60s. Oh, gosh, Uncle Ben and gee whiz. Although that's not actually in there, but I feel like that would just fit right in. It would fit right in, yeah, no. And it's insanely fast-paced, isn't it? Mm. Because the the Spider-Man portion of the comic book is actually only half the comic. Yeah. And it manages to establish Peter Parker, Mm -hmm. establish that he's a nerd, Mm -hmm. establish Flash Thompson, establish that he's a bully. It then establishes Uncle Ben, Aunt May, as his loving caregivers. It Mm -hmm. then has him being bitten by a spider, learning about his powers winning a wrestling match, making his costume, letting the robber go free, Uncle Ben's death, and catching the robber, all within 12 pages. (laughs) I got bored of saying yes there, because it was so much. (laughs) Yes, that happened. Yeah, it happened. Okay, I'll now shut up. I mean, yeah, I mean, by the eighth page, I was bored of the way that they had to describe everything on screen, um, on page even. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the bit where Peter's like, oh, I better fasten these web shooters to my wrist as he's doing it on page. I'm yeah. like, yeah, we can see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely agree. I mean, the writing is not the most subtle. No. It's hard to beat the economy of story per panel that you get in this comic book. And it is amazing to think that, you know, this is an anthology comic book. So there was three stories in this comic book in total. This was 12 pages of that whole comic. Mm-hmm. The things you think of when you think of Spider-Man, the web shooters, the costume, Uncle Ben, Aunt yeah. May, all of this stuff, It's all here, right from the offset. It's not stuff that's developed over time. It is, bam, on the page. Here's Spider-Man. Yeah, I was amazing. so surprised how close it was to the film. Mm. You know, you did a long list there, but there was the wrestling part. Mm -hmm. There's Uncle Ben's death and also Peter not stopping the guy who then goes on to kill him. Yeah. You know, I was shocked that's in there. I thought some of this was either made for film or came later on and whatever. It's all there, right from the origin story. Everything that makes Peter Parker Spider-Man and makes him so well known to everyone is right there at the beginning. He's a really fully fleshed character Mm -hmm. right from the offset. A lot of other characters don't do that. A lot of them, their lore is built up over time and most of their iconic stuff comes later. But this is right there. I have read Amazing Fantasy 15 before, but a long, long time ago. And I agree with what you're saying, actually. And we'll, we'll say about this when we go on to Amazing Spider-Man 39 to 40 as well. Mm-hmm. I do struggle with the dialogue. Yeah. It, it's far too overwritten. And we talked about this a bit when we covered Lee and Kirby's Fantastic Four and Claremont's mm-hmm. X-Men. Yep. But I think this is the worst case of that. And there were definitely moments where, I've got to say... I was skipping over the dialogue, (laughs) just looking at the art, because all he was doing was saying exactly what was happening on page over and over again. 100%. I mean, I I enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. It was (laughs) was interesting to read and to go back to this thing, but I won't go back to it for a long time, if ever. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) It is difficult reading. I mean, I think there's a lot to like here, and I think the fact that you can read the comic book without actually reading the words is interesting i think that's um yeah. says something for the dialogue going on but yeah far too much because this is the marvel method that we talked about before where you have the artist does all the art basically does all the planning and all this stuff yep. and then the writer comes along looks at the page and then writes the dialogue and writes everything on so all they're doing is looking at the page and going well he's doing this so i'll write that and he's saying this so i'll write that <laughs> yeah and it's it's unnecessary it made sense back then but you kind of go did you have to show and write exactly what's happening yeah you are showing and telling, yeah. which is unnecessary. So that's, I mean, amazing fantasy. We've got on to 
Amazing Spider-Man 39 to 40. So what do you make of those? I found it a lot easier to read Mm -hmm. than the first one, even though it's still pretty text heavy. Yeah. There's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Actually, before we get into it, was this the first time it was shown that Norman was the Green Goblin to the readers? I know obviously to Spider-Man, but to the readers. Bear in mind that it's been a while since I read it, but I believe so. Mm. I think it is. I think this was the reveal of green goblin he was just sort of a, a villain who had turned up before yeah so i know now we know who it is we've seen the films people have seen cartoons and whatever hmm. so it's a well-known kind of fact for comic book fans who he is but i can imagine if you read this when it came out and you kind of go jesus christ it's his it's his friend's dad like yeah that's mental <laughs> <laughs> like, okay it, fine it's, a, it's definitely a twist and this is something it did a lot back then is there the twist reveals you know you had at the end of issue one two two is you have a figure in the shadow mm. after he's walking away and it said we'll reveal this later and it does reveal that later and it's not as big a twist as you might think um, but uh was it peter parker it, it was peter parker watching peter parker walk away time travel was it peter it parker it was it was harry i thought i was i was gonna ask i thought it was <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the writing improves. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we've jumped is it a decade or two at this point. Uh, I believe we have jumped 80s? forward about four years. <laughs> oh, it's still 60s then. Amazing Fantasy was 1962. This is 1966. Oh, okay. Fair enough. The Gil Kane, the Amazing Fantasy 1-2-1-1-2-2, one, two, one, two, one, two, two, those are 1973. So that is 11 years on from the, wow. the first issue. Like, yeah. So 39, 40, mm-hmm. you've still got... I mean, it's improved, as in the writing, but you've still got like the classic lines of, oh, that fateful night, you know, I mm. remember that. And Yeah, yeah, you really have those uh, purple pros. And Stan Lee, who at this point, I can only assume he's in his 40s, was mm. trying to write a teenager again. And yeah, it doesn't work, you know. <laughs> we know he can't. <laughs> we, we learned that in uh, Fantastic Four. X-Men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these two runs, it's predominantly about the green goblin yes it's almost like a highlight reel of his life also he's a lot harder on harry than in the films and from what yeah. i've seen before you know calls him a spineless jellyfish and a sniveling weakling of a son yeah which i'm like that's really horrible the spineless thing i mean that's mean but fair enough but like <laughs> talk about your son in that way that's really bloody horrible yeah, he's, he's not a good guy. No, he's also, not. Also, kills people. Ah, oh, he does, doesn't he? Yeah. He does. Well, that take us on nicely to 121 to 122. So this is a big storyline in terms of Spider-Man lore. This is, mm. uh, spoiler alert, the death of Gwen Stacy, which is what the storyline is called. So again, spoiler alert. But I like the titles not revealed to the last page, which is quite clever. Yeah, it was. It had that big front page where he's looking at all of his friends and family and things like that. And he says, one of these people will die. Mm. And then it reveals it on the last page. It's like, that's good. Yeah, I'll be honest. When you told me we were going to read this, part of me was like, well, why are we reading about the death of Gwen Stacy when she's not in the film? Yeah. And I almost questioned you. It's like, have you got the numbers wrong? <laughs> like, I didn't because <laughs> you normally don't. But then, yeah, it's there's so much in here that's in the film again. Yeah. You know, there's the bridge scene where film is Mary Jane, comic it's Gwen. Mm-hmm. And the death by Glider with the goblin, yes. pretty much the same scene. All of that. So basically this whole, from the point of the bridge onwards, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. It's, she gets thrown off the bridge in the, comic obviously she dies from that in the film she doesn't but peter parker manages to rescue her and then obviously there's a fight in a warehouse where like you say green goblin impales himself so much of it has been plundered that when they then did the death of gwen stacy in films Mm. in amazing spider-man 2 they couldn't do it the same because it would have been exactly like the first (laughs) spider-man film well her actual death i mean you you see or kind of read that her neck snaps it just goes Mm -hmm. snap and you're like, oh, yeah, because in the films, there's always that thing going, was it him? Was it the head on the floor? Was it the her neck that snapped? But in this, it's, it's there. It's obvious. It's Where is it, though? Because you notice she doesn't speak from the moment Peter Parker arrives. She is lying face down on the floor and then Green Goblin throws her over the edge. OK, so it is possible that she was dead before Peter arrived, that the shock killed her is what Green Goblin said. Yeah. But then there's also, like you say, there's that snap 
as her head snaps back as Peter Parker catches her. Okay, well, it's obvious her neck snaps. That definitely happens. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I can't say that's what killed her. I like the ambiguity, though. I like yeah. that it is... And people say, oh, it's Peter Parker catching her that killed her. And it's like, well, no, because if he hadn't have caught her, she still would have died. She would have hit the water. Yeah. <laughs> so it's either way, it was not a survival thing. But, you know, I've always been of the view that she was dead before Peter even arrived or certainly was dead before he caught her. But yeah. you know, I like the ambiguity. I like that there's options there. I mean, as you said, start of this section, if you will... The writers change, the artists all change. This one, to me, was the easiest to read. Yes, definitely. And even the artwork, it's so bright and vibrant. You almost see the action coming off the page. Yeah. If that makes sense. It all flows well. Definitely. No, I I agree. I really liked these issues. They're still fairly dialogue heavy, but you Mm. have a lot less narration of what is going on on the page. And because of that, like you say, you shift from panel to panel a lot quicker and it creates a better flow. The problem with those other issues is you spend so long reading each panel and then you move on to another image. It's like a sequential view of static images. It doesn't feel like a flow of action Mm. because you're having to pour over this guy saying, and if I do a backflip now and touch on this pad on my wrist, it's like, yeah, I can see this. (laughs) You're doing it. It's it's fine. Yeah. And I don't know if... I don't remember this being in the earlier issues, but there probably was. But in this one, I was a lot more... I saw them a lot more Is the classic comic book onomatopoeic words. Mm-hmm. You know, like the whoomph and the spang and the bunt. Like it, and it works well. They definitely were about in the Silver Age, yeah. But I, certain artists use them more than others. Mm. We're technically just into the Bronze Age here in terms of comic book groupings and eras so this is 1970s onwards Mm -hmm. we're just into that and you can see how much it's developed in that just that short amount of time from the 1960s to the 1970s you have a lot less of that dialogue heavy you have more on anatopia you have more trust in the artist to tell the story which is what the artist was always doing it was what kirby and ditko were doing back in the day or ramita but there was always this presumption that the writer had to then come along and explain everything which is by this point not as prevalent which is good Definitely, because it makes it a lot easier to read. Really does, yeah. But the most important thing to me, actually, in all of these issues we've read, is what differentiates Spider-Man from other heroes, particularly of this era. It's the Archie-like soap opera shenanigans. You know, the fact that Peter has to contend with bullies and romance and his best friend overdosing on LSD. (laughs) Yeah. I know that this thing is sort of commonplace, nowadays in superhero comics but you can really see why this stood out at the time and why it stood the test of time Mm -hmm. this is what marvel made their name on is is sort of real identifiable characters and storylines as opposed to superman saves another plane or that sort of thing so i mean what do you make of that because you're probably quite familiar with it obviously coming into this from modern comics but obviously going back what do you think i mean you know i thought there was a huge gap between these but not really you definitely do see the change of style and artwork and how it trusts the reader a lot more yeah i know they still do that thing where it's like as seen in issue 200 or 69 editor's notes yeah yeah it's still there but i think it's a couple of the ones that they said i'll go back to this issue was an issue that we'd read Mm -hmm. so i've seen that from two perspectives now it's either with the x-men where i hadn't read that particular run and then now where i've read that particular scene or comic It works the two ways. You know, you don't have to read it to understand it. You can just use those little notes. Yeah. There is a lot more trust from the writers and the artists for the readers. Yeah. No, there definitely is. And what what do you make of those sort of soap opera aspects of the storytelling? This is the first one, really, that I've seen it in. Because X-Men kind of a little bit. X-Men, I would feel, has had a real soap opera vibe to it. Yeah. I always find. But yeah, other than that. I think you've got a mix of, like, children and the adults or teachers in it i know you've got a couple of adults in this but they're mainly all quite young you know they're all they were all high school age bar a couple this heavily leans into that a lot more than the x-men probably should do from what i've read i mean x-men are mostly teenagers remember yeah but then you've got like professor x and magneto and storm and cyclops so they're Storm would have been early 20s, Cyclops would have been early 20s, all of the other characters, Colossus and that, when we were reading them, would have been teenagers, Kitty Pride, teenager. They're all around the same age group. All I can think of now is, in my opinion, amazing cartoon show, X-Men Evolution. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you say all teenagers, I didn't think of that straight away. <laughs> Yeah, no, but that same, there would have been a similar age group. Yeah. And that's not a coincidence, obviously, both created, at least partially, by Stan Lee, mm. trying to tap into that teen market. Yeah. Perhaps you weren't reading the X Men in particular in that light because you're used to them being older. Yeah. But 
certainly the comics we read from Chris Claremont, they were all in their late teens, early 20s. Yeah, I suppose because I've seen the films and they're older, mm. and then going back to the comic, you don't see it in the mindset of, right, these are kids. Yeah. They've gone through puberty. Now they can fire some bolts out of their hands or something stupid. <laughs> Where to me, Peter Parker's always been a teenager. So I think I'm seeing it a lot more in this because it's high school friends. It's a teenager with a power of this sort of stuff. But yeah, on paper, X-Men is the same. Yeah. But he was only he was only actually a teenager in the first handful of issues. Apart from Amazing Fantasy that we read today, the rest of the issues, he's early 20s. He's in the city. He's working. He's a photographer. He's going to university. Yeah. You know, he's got a job. He's not actually a teenager in most of these comic books we've read today. I think it's only the first handful or so that he actually is. It's an idea, again, that people have got ingrained in their head, mostly from cartoons. Yeah. And it's always interesting to see. It's the surrounding media is what people get in their head about a character. Ultimate Spider-Man had him being in school a lot longer, Mm -hmm. whereas most iterations of Peter Parker, he is in his sort of early 20s. Yeah. I mean, well, you're talking about me there. You know, you say that most people, that's me. I've watched the films, watched the cartoons, read online about them, watch clips on online, all this sort of stuff. And then when you go, well, actually, it's only the first 10 issues or whatever. He's like, oh, fair enough. <laughs> like, that is a surprise. Yeah. As I realize, sort of, we haven't really answered the question. So <laughs> the soap opera aspects of this comic book, yeah. the love interests, the high school bullying, the moment at the end with his friends and his drug overdoses, which makes up about 60% of the book, you know, and the rest is the sort of superheroics and the, the antics with the Green Goblin. But mm. a lot of the comic books are Peter in his downtime. It's talking to friends and family. It's the relationships between them. I quite liked it. Actually, in this, especially in these runs, because I know these characters, not from reading them, but I know who they are. Yeah. So it's easier for me to read them because I know or I've seen them in other things than it is for me to read about someone that I don't know. Yeah. So I might not know all the facts prior to the films, like probably you did. But yeah, it's, it works. It's nice to see a different side of it than just like this space alien comes down and saves the world or something stupid. Yeah. Like Parker, there's a good balance of hero and his personal life yes especially from what i've read today or i've read this week it works well it's been portrayed on the pages really well definitely i think that is what set spider-man ahead of a lot of other heroes it's why he is i think it's not even close he is the best selling in terms of merch and all of his other stuff financially best selling superhero character of all time Mm -hmm. and you know it's got one of my favorite character interactions of spider-man and Mary Jane in these comic books is after Gwen Stacy is killed towards the end of the comic book he snaps at Mary Jane and says you know go away and whatever Mm -hmm. and she's got an option of whether to go out partying or leave as he accuses her he says why don't you just go out partying because at this time she was known as the sort of party girl yeah and he snaps at her and she has this moment of hesitation and then she shuts the door and stays with him at the end of the comic book. And I think it's a really nice personal moment, a very mm. small thing, but a very believable. It shows Peter to be fallible because he's prone to grief and getting angry at a person who's just trying to help him. And then it shows Mary Jane as caring. It yep. creates this genuinely emotional moment you know it doesn't have any caption on the page to say what's going on it doesn't say literally what this emotional beat is about but you understand it and i think it adds a lot to the character yeah they're a lot more human yeah exactly and i think that is what spider-man does better than most other heroes is the human side of him yeah i mean even though he's got all this power and strength he can still be hurt Mm. And normally it's his feelings. It's the emotional side of it. Yeah. It happens in the film. Obviously, we have, you know, don't go after his body or his soul or saying go after his heart. I can't remember the exact line, but something like that. <laughs> oh, that line. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, the Green Goblin where he says, <laughs> don't go after whatever it is, but go after his other thing, his heart. That is, that's word from word. <laughs> that's word from word. <laughs> right. Have you got any Easter eggs this week? A couple. All right. We might as well get on with it then. All right. Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. I'm not yoking you. So, first off, this film is littered with spider and web references. Mm-hmm. The wallpaper is in his room, it's like little webs outside Harry and his flat. There's a sign that says the web string platform. Ooh. So, I like how Sam Raimi sort of just started to put these in and I think it's one of the earliest films that start to use eggs in a way. Comic book eggs, I mean. The earliest sort of comic book film, really. It's not really. Well, that, that, that sort of that took off. 
no, actually, he's Superman, Batman. Yeah, in the 70s. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about Sam Raimi, yeah. Uncle Ben's car, the classic Delta 88, I think it is. Yeah. That car's appeared in a bunch of Sam Raimi's films. I think almost every single one of them, yeah. Yeah, Evil Dead trilogy, yep. uh, Dark Man, mm-hmm. Drag Me to Hell, bunch more. Do you know, he even tells a story, he did a film called Quick and the Dead, which is a Western. Okay. There is a story surrounding that, that he stripped that whole car back, mm. built a wagon around it, and then put a horse on the front of it just so he could get it in that film. <laughs> Clever. Yeah. Clever person. I don't know if it's true or not, but that is the story. No, it's fact. It's, because it's now been <laughs> said on the podcast, it's now fact. Okay. Don't go away and look that up. It's fact. I did make it up, by the way. I think it was Bruce Campbell said about that. <laughs> but yeah, talking about cars, there's a police car with a reg plate of 1927. That was the year that Steve Ditko was born. Cool. As we know, he's the artist that brought him to the page. The artist that is very much credited with creating the character in many ways. In fact, there's a whole lawsuit going on, which you may have seen on Twitter at the moment, where Mm. his family are trying to get more residues from Marvel, basically, for his creation of this character. So, yeah, it's a bit of an ugly situation. Am I right in saying that him and Stanley fell out and then he went away to work for DC? Both Ditko and Kirby fell out with Stanley. Kirby, yeah. Um, yeah. So both of them did, and, and both of them went to work for DC or independent comic books, and that is largely because of how artists were treated at the time. <laughs> because they were hired on a work for higher basis, but, you know, they were largely solely responsible for creating most of these characters. You know, the writers came in a lot of the times afterwards and would slap some words on them Mm. but the artists were the ones coming up with the storylines and the action beats and the characters all the designs and then the writer would come along and say right well here's my words and then obviously because it was owned by marvel marvel would credit the writer and credit themselves and give the artist a bit of cash yeah it doesn't sound quite fair it definitely doesn't yeah i'm glad we're getting more recognition nowadays for the artists who actually created these characters Mm. as opposed to an idea in people's head that stan lee created everything because he's in the films and because he puts himself front and center yeah he's even in captain america and he didn't even create captain america he's nothing to do with captain america's creation (laughs) captain america (laughs) i'm pretty sure that's what you just said (laughs) well yeah talking about fair at the unity fair you know what I did there? I see it. Harry says to MJ, I told you to wear the black dress to impress my father. Yeah. And then later on in the film, we see a portrait of a lady in a black dress. Yes. We're not told who it is, but it could either be his dead wife or it could be his mum, possibly. But like they've put in that thing in the background yeah. to explain why Harry would have said that. Yeah, exactly. And then in the next scene that they're in together, the Thanksgiving scene, she is wearing the black dress. Which is... I'm glad you said yeah. that. Because uh, a nice interesting fact about that scene is that Peter and Norman switch colours. So you've got Norman's wearing, I think it's a red tie and a blue shirt, so Spider-Man's colours. Yeah. And then Peter's wearing the green goblins, well, green. (laughs) He's wearing a green shirt. And it's the scene, obviously, when Norman finds out who he is. So I quite like that they've sort of switched the colours there. It's really interesting. That reminded me a lot of the scene from Spider-Man Homecoming, one of my favourite scenes in the Marvel comic book films, where the Vulture finds out that Peter is Spider-Man as well, and he has that moment in the car. And you know, I think those great tense moments—they remind me of *Inglorious Bastards*, the film *Inglorious Bastards*. There's just these great tense moments where something is about to be discovered, and everyone knows it. Yeah, it's really clever. It's obviously it's not them fighting not a mask get pulls off whatever mm. it's it's intense and it's yeah he's worked it out so, oh and then yeah. he leaves i'm like oh fine <laughs> he <laughs> has an emotional reaction to it rather than being an aggressive fighting reaction he just sort of stumbles out a bit disorientated i really like that but yeah a couple more left okay something that i wouldn't have noticed is an egg because in the film when he goes to the wrestling it says you get three grand to be in the ring for three minutes yes. and then because he knocks him out in two he's past 100 yeah which in the comics, it's 100 for that time. So I'm thinking, oh, they've put that clever. But also, talk about inflation. <laughs> it was 100 <laughs> in the 60s, and it's like three grand in the noughties. Yeah, Ridiculous. who knows what that would be nowadays. <laughs> and my final one, this isn't an Easter egg, but I want to just chuck it in. The food scene where he catches all that food on the tray. Yep. That was done for realsies. For realsies. I'm bringing it back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was magnets and all yeah. sorts on that tray. Haley said the same thing to me. He was like, apparently did that for real. I'm like, oh, 
For realsies. I mean, it would have been a waste of... C- we saw how the CGI turned out. <laughs> a waste of time trying to CGI. Yeah, I think someone said, oh, it took 156 takes or something. But I think that was on... Wow. That's not actually true. I think that was um, on the audio commentary. I think one of the guys says it. But I think he says it in a joke. He's like, oh, this took so long. And finally, on the 156, blah, blah. And then everyone's like, oh, it took them this long. It's like, no, it took them a long time, but not right. that many takes. Yeah. It's not like Stanley Kubrick's directed it. It's not like <laughs> 157 takes. Okay, cool. Well, well, is that it for Ian's egg hunt this week? Yes. Something I didn't write down is, of course, there's a little sneaky Stanley cameo, which is quite blink and you miss it. There is. It's at the fair, isn't it? He sort yeah. of grabs a child and runs off. Not in that way. He grabs <laughs> That's, <a child> whoa. And... <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> anyway, should we move on? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to it. So, in conclusion, what do you make of the film? What do you make of the comic? Film, as I said, holds up. It didn't change my opinion. I think it improved it, in fact because a lot worse films have come out since this film came out, Mm -hmm. which is surprising. You would think they'd get better. They they don't. (laughs) The comic, really interesting. Again, it made me appreciate the film more, because as we've already said, the first issue, number 15, Amazing Fantasy, there's so much in there that it's not only in the film, but it's part of his backstory it's his origin you know it's yeah. it's all there in the first 10 12 pages yeah definitely how about you now the film's surprisingly good it's really well paced origin story it's got genuine character it is goofy and cartoonish at times but it never once feels bland or just another piece in a greater universe. Mm. They have put it into the hands of a director who hasn't played it safe he's not played it subdued at all not everything works but you can't deny that it is all unique and really good fun. The comic books, like you say, amazed by how much came out of those first 12 pages of Amazing Fantasy 15. Mm. i got to say, those early issues are difficult to read, but beautiful to look at. And there's a lot of good stuff to like in them. And then the death of Gwen Stacy, I really enjoyed that storyline. There's a reason it's an all-time classic, and it is a shock value. Well, it was at the time, at least, to kill off the superhero's loved one, Mm -hmm. who was an established character for 120 issues or so. It's become a bit of a thing now with fridging and whatnot but um which we've talked about on the show before (laughs) but women in fridges it was genuinely interesting and a big twist at the time yeah and what is kate's opinion she gave me a two-line answer which is perfect that's too long too long (laughs) half it one line or nothing she said (laughs) she said i actually really enjoyed that followed by but i would fire the continuity guy (laughs) because there's so many things in here that we both realized the continuity is terrible. <laughs> the very last scene where I think MJ's got her hand on his neck or his face and it cuts and a hand that isn't there. And it's <laughs> back and her hand's there again. We see these things because I think my Easter egg hunt sort of... You're hunting them. Well, I'm not doing it, but she's like, look, look, look at that. Continuity. Fair enough. I can't say I noticed it, but yeah. Right. <laughs> so I haven't got anything planned, but have you got any other business? I have got some any other business. You love a quiz. Ooh. As we know. So, to kickstart this new year of episodes, I thought I would design a quiz for you. Have you got a theme tune? I do. First, I'll give you the name of the quiz. This quiz is called Spider-Man Villain or Just an Animal. <laughs> Fantastic. And the, the theme tune goes like this. Is it a Spider-Man Villain or is it just an animal? I don't know. Hopefully you do. If you don't, we haven't got a show. Anyway, so the basic (laughs) rules are this. Spider-Man has a lot of animal-themed villains. Mm -hmm. So I am going to give you the name of an animal, and you're going to say if you think it is one of Spider-Man's rogues gallery, or just the name of an animal. There are bonus points on offer if you can tell me what powers the just an animal options would have if they were a Spider-Man villain. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Okay. So it's very simple. Very simple quiz. It's quick fire. There are 20 questions. So I'm going to throw these out at you and you've got to tell me. So I'll start you off easy. Vulture. Villain. Correct. Chameleon. Chameleon. Villain. Correct. Jackal. I mean, I don't know, but I want to say villain. That's correct. Responsible for all the cloning bullshit that went down in the 90s. (laughs) <laughs> kangaroo oh it's a quiz and fun fact <laughs> so sorry no more fun facts right oh, sorry <laughs> kangaroo animal <laughs> no that is also a spider-man villain wow a kangaroo does he jump one. high he does jump high yeah he's got sort of pneumatic legs i think has he got a tail he does have a tail yeah he's australian <laughs> as well christ. Just for jesus christ fennec fox 
Fennec Fox. Fennec Fox. I mean, I don't know him, but it's got the double F. Is that you being clever? Animal. Ding! It is an animal. Nice. So what powers would Fennec Fox have if he were a Spider-Man villain? Quick. Be sly. Be cunning. Yeah, all of those things. Eat garbage. <laughs> do, do Fennec foxes it? Whatever. <laughs> uh, okay, bonus point there on offer. I'll give you it. Next up, we have Scorpion. Villain. Black Tarantula. Pause for effect. I honestly don't know. Um, I've not heard of him, but I'm going to say villain. That is correct. Yes. Then we have Tarantula. Oh, animal. No, that's also a villain. They're really running out of names of villains, aren't they? God's sake. <laughs> Next up, we have Bush Baby. Bush Baby. <laughs> oh, I hope that's true. Yeah, sod it. Villain. No, that one is just an animal, I'm afraid. So what powers uh, I thought would... he'd be Australian. <laughs> <laughs> what powers would Bush Baby have? Be able to camouflage with like little, little cute stuffed animals, like little toys, and then go, rah, I'm here. <laughs> It's quite specific. He mainly <laughs> targets people in toy stores. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, next up is the human fly. The human fly. That's probably a villain. That is a villain. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Next up is the manatee. The manatee. Villain. No, that's an animal. So, what powers would the manatee have? I honestly I don't know. I can't think of what a manatee is. <laughs> My brain's gone. <laughs> it's a large aquatic sea creature. Oh, okay. Um, sort of uh, like a narwhal, if that helps. If you don't know what a manatee is, I don't know why I think you know what a narwhal is. No, I, 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 I really do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that did help. Um, I would say you'd be able to swim really quickly and dive really deep. Okay. I'm not giving you a point for that. No, I don't. <laughs> the most generic sea-based powers ever. That's not, that's not specific to a manatee. Okay. All right, I'm going to wrap this up now. To Gibbon. Animal. Spider-Man villain, I'm afraid. Gibbon. Ah. Wait, next up, we've got Man-Wolf. Man-Wolf? Man-Wolf. I'm pretty sure that is a villain. That is a villain. That is a villain indeed. That is J. Jonah Jameson's son who goes to the moon, turns into a werewolf. Oh, cool. Obviously. <laughs> Clearly. Next up, we have Pandamania. Pandamania. God. Um, sounds like a weird craze. Villain. That is also a villain. You're correct. <laughs> Next up, we have Husky Jack. Husky Jack. Oh, that's got to be a villain. Husky Jack. That's got to be a villain. No, that is just an animal. <laughs> wow. So what powers would Husky Jack have? I mean, I don't know why, but I'm thinking of like... Or a Craven the Hunter kind of guy, but yeah, that's that's all I've got. Okay, no, a hairy like chest it. and a and a hairy chest and a deep voice. A hairy chest, but like a snow-based, husky-based Craven the Hunter. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, last few. White Rabbit, animal. No, that is a uh, an Alice in Wonderland themed villain. God's sake. Next up after that, we have Hippo. <laughs> Hippo, animal. No, that is also a Spider-Man villain. Jesus Christ. Next up, we have the immortal jellyfish. Animal. That is just an animal. Yes. What power would the immortal jellyfish have? Like electricity powers, but it wouldn't zap itself. Okay. I'm not going to give you any points because you didn't say immortality, which seems like ah, the obvious answer. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, last two. Dr. Octopus. Oh, that's got to be, um, hmm, let me think, Dylan. <laughs> that's correct. And lastly, Professor Pig. The pig. I'm thinking of a... That's a Batman villain, isn't it? Hey, it was a trick question. It is a Batman villain. Yay! <laughs> you thought you'd get me on that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I did think I'd get you on that. Right, let me just work out your scores. One, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen out of twenty, whatever points were possibly on offer. Congratulations. <laughs> I give that a not amazing Spider-Man, but a spectacular Spider-Man out of twenty. And I appreciate it. By the way, I was making this quiz and I thought, that's a funny idea for a quiz. I'll do 10 questions. And then I looked up how many animal-themed Spider-Man villains <laughs> there are. It is insane. 
like <laughs> they are just scraping the bottom of the barrel when it comes to animals quite frankly. i could have made this quiz 50 questions long and i still wouldn't have had to put any fictional animals in there. <laughs> <laughs> i'll be honest i thought when you said about some points for stuff i thought you'd say and you get an extra point if you can tell me their proper name and their their real name i mean we can do that if you want but then i don't think you're gonna get many points well, no but i was thinking you know because then if you said like dr octopus be like octo octavius Otto, sorry, Otto Octavius. Otto Octavius. The only one I could think of that for that would be for the manatee, is I would call him Humanity. <laughs> but he's not even a real Spider-Man villain, so. Oh well, yeah, I, I meant the actual Spider-Man, <laughs> not to make not to make him up for animals. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that quiz. I did actually. Yeah, it was quite fun, but I'm annoyed. I'll leave the quizzes to you in the future, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please don't. I hate them. No, I'm not. Don't really. They're a good laugh and a good way to end the show. Yeah, that's debatable. But speaking of ending the show, we better wrap things up. Thank you, everyone, for listening. That's all for this episode. If you enjoyed the Spider-Man comics that we covered this week and are looking for more to read, then I'll just throw out a recommendation for Marvel Unlimited. There are literally thousands of comics to catch up on for less than £8 a month. More useful advice, however, would be to say to drop back to issue 50 and read Spider-Man No More. Then check out Craven's Last Hunt and The Death of Jean de Wolf for some all-time classic Spider-Man storylines. As always, you can get in touch with us at becometheteapot at hotmail.com or on Twitter at becometheteapod. We're also available on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, and we can be summoned by shining the teapot signal into the night sky. The location of the signal is a closely guarded secret, but if you subscribe, we may tell you where it is. Next episode, it's spoopy season, and in accordance with American tradition, we'll be celebrating the life of Irish horror enthusiast Hal Oween with a scary vampire movie. For episode 30, we'll be watching and reading 30 Days of Night. Um, it's episode 29, actually. We had to reshuffle some stuff. God damn it. Um, this isn't this isn't an Easter egg, but well, don't, don't say it then. Don't say it. See no, Ian's second. But bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye. <laughs> See ya.